Good afternoon, everybody in the room and as well as online. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to this panel. My name is Judith Schwem Sterling, and I'm the professor of Prof um, Responsible Management at the Geneva School of Economics and Management uh, at the University of Geneva. I'm honored and very happy to welcome you here to this exciting um, panel discussion on stakeholder governance and transparency for the triple impact economy. Business and their managers are confronted with grand societal challenges such as climate change, poverty, hunger, and inequality. And the COVID-19 pandemic um, has put the spotlight on these business challenges even more so. And it will change framework conditions of markets for years to come. With the ongoing global pandemic, calls have become even louder to rethink the business model to ensure positive societal and environmental impact. Companies need to develop business models that are resilient that set them up for lasting recovery and sustainable business success. Investors, employees, customers, consumers are expecting companies to build back better and put the triple bottom line that is prosperity, people and planet front and center. What this means and how this can be done is the topic of our panel today. I'm excited to have four wonderful experts at my side. So let me briefly introduce the panelists to you. Um, to my very... Um, to, to my right, right is Jonathan Normand, who is the CEO and founder of B-Lab Switzerland, a nonprofit organization that serves a global movement of people using business as a force for good. He is promoting fiduciary enhancement and socio-environmental impact measurement standards, as well as the B Corp movement and the Swiss Triple Impact Initiative. Then there is um, Beth Krasna, she, um, who is a business, Swiss business executive who has been the head of five different companies. She's currently the chairperson of Etta Services, president of the foundation board at the Graduate Institute, and the vice president of the board of Symbiotics, just to name a few. Um, then there is Andre Hoffmann, who is the vice president of Roche Holding Switzerland and a member of the board of directors of the wholly owned subsidiary Genentech um, in California. In addition to his non-executive positions within the family business, he has a strong background in nature conservation and sustainability. Last but not least is Angela De Wolf, who is a founding partner at Conser Invest. She has been active in the financial sector for almost 30 years, focusing on responsible investment. She's a member of the board of the Banque Cantonale de Genève and a former president of Sustainable Finance Geneva. So the topic of our panel is stakeholder governance and transparency for a triple impact economy. As a professor at the Geneva School of Economics and Management, I talk a lot with my students about the role of business and society and the meaning of impact, prosperity, people, and planet. I would like to kick off our panel discussion by asking each panelist to give us a one, two-minute elevator pitch to the following question that I encounter a lot as a business professor. Students often ask me what skills and knowledge do they need to support business to be a force for good? From your experience and perspective, what are the skills that the triple impact economy will need from the future generation of managers? And I'll start with you, Jonathan. Thank you, Judith. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, build up vision, and our vision is that business um, can make significant contribution uh, to addressing major social, societal challenges. Um, and so, however, this change requires uh, a paradigm shift in, in the way a whole company operates. Uh, and so redefining uh, role and responsibility uh, of businesses is key. Um, obviously, now it becomes uh, kind of a... Uh, you know, a trend, uh, but when we started like 15 years ago, it was quite new. Um, and so by equipping companies uh, with B-Lab with, you know, uh, stakeholder governance uh, element, bylaw change, uh, impact measurement and standards, uh, we, we really help them to, to manage and work the work in the journey for, 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 for this impact. And, and basically what we want to say to, to those new generation is that, yes, we want that, you know, businesses manage rigorously their impact as they do for their financial forecast and, and, and financial management. And, and then, yeah, that's, that's a change that actually bring this uh, um, element of governance and transparency on the top of the agenda that we can, yeah, try to set up. Uh, and, and now with more than 4,000 companies all around the world uh, and, and, and 60 of them here in Switzerland, you know, to, to become this reference model of the new economic player that are you know, the 21st century economic player 
what it looked like. Stakeholder governance in one wing, in strong and robust impact management in the other one, and that led to you know, tremendous capacity to set up the market infrastructure that we are designing for the Agenda 2030. So, you know, big, uh, big challenges, but uh, Building Bridge helped on a lot on that uh, currently. Yeah, thank you. I'll turn to you, Beth. What would you tell my students? Okay, so if I was addressing the students directly, I would tell them that for me, the triple impact economy was contr contributing to reach the 17 um, SDG goals. And uh, businesses can do that by having a positive impact on the three Ps, as you mentioned. I would have put purpose first, people second, and profit third, as opposed to prosperity mm -hmm. uh, in first place. Um, progress on all three fronts needs to be measured. And so I believe uh, the students need to develop a mixture of hard and soft skills uh, to ensure transparency, carry out impact assessments, and deal with the data. So I personally would suggest that they concentrate on the following skills, which would be critical thinking, data analysis, cultural awareness, and empathy. Thank you. Andre. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> the question is, you know, what is business for good? Because when you ask this question, you imply that there is business that is not for good. And in fact, you can even go one step further. There is business for bad. And I think that um, uh, there is our problem. Over the last uh, uh, 65 years, or perhaps even since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we have been running our businesses on one single mantra, which is short-term profit maximization. Whatever we do, it needs to pay back quickly. So dear students of the future, if you really want to change something, you're going to have to do business in a different way. And that doesn't mean you're making it for good. It just makes you do it for the long term. You are going to have to run a business sustainably. And in order to be able to understand what a sustainable prosperity means, and I really do mean that prosperity is an important word because we are going to be 10 billion people on the planet, and if you don't have prosperity, a lot of these people will be in, 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 in difficulties, and we don't want that. So if we want to create prosperity, we are going to have to change the way we measure success. Success is not just increasing dividends and making shareholders richer. Success is about contributing positively to, the, to, to society uh, by executing the purpose of your employer. Now, um, uh, the best purposes are the ones which are not just determined by a company, but which are co-created. I'll give you the example of our company, Hoffman La Roche. We do today what the, what the patient needs tomorrow. In that single sentence, we include an awful lot of the things which attract people to come and work for us. Our purpose is to save lives, and we can do that only if we think long terms, um, in particular in a complex industry like, like pharmaceuticals. So my advice to students would be to don't listen to all the details, just focus on the main idea. Business is what's going to, to, to regenerate, perhaps even restore the planet to where it should have been before we started focusing on short-term profit maximization. Thank you. Angela, yes. your elevator pitch. <laughs> yes. First of all, uh, I just want to share um, a certain vision. It's the fact that for youngs today, it's to keep optimism. I think it's, we are facing major challenges and it's not easy for the new generation to keep this uh, optimism for the future. But I'm really impressed by the capacity of entrepreneurship, of collective working together, and this capacity of youngs to, to keep on, on collaboration. We don't see yet where is the solution, but we know that all together we will find a solution that probably we don't know yet. So please keep on going and keep your optimism on the future. And my second will be an advice on my personal experience. I think if you want to have a, a, a dialogue with the economy, you need first to have an, a certain expertise to get to know what exactly is needed, or it's about technology, or it's about finance, but you need to have a real grounded expertise in order to start a dialogue with also the decision maker of today. And after you can add the sustainability and the large goals. But it's both together that really make the change. All right, thank you, thank you very much. Um, to give you also a brief overview of uh, the organization of the panel, so we had now the elevator pitch, like an opening, kind of, you know, getting a first kind of, you know, um, 
sense of what the next uh, 70, 80 minutes will be like. And what I will do now, I will ask a few questions to the panelists. But then um, in, the, in the last part of, of the panel, you know, the last 20, 30 minutes, there will be open questions from the audience. So maybe while you're already here, maybe you already heard something from the elevator pitch, or later on when you hear something and you, you know, want to ask a question, keep that in mind, you will have the opportunity to also um, join into the discussion because that's quite important to us. So starting now um, with a few pointy questions to each panelist, I'd like to start again with you, Jonathan. Um, so you are the CEO and founder of B-Lab Switzerland, which is an NGO, and you support Swiss businesses to become this force for good, and we ho heard already a lot about that. Um, what do you think are the strengths of an NGO like yours in moving the economy forward towards this triple impact? And also maybe your limitations, maybe for your own, but also maybe NGOs more general. Yeah, and, and, and back to our theory of change at B-Lab, you know, bringing uh, a system change approach, so really business system change, uh, by redefining, you know, the success of business in a way that, you know, how they operate, uh, taking into account their, you know, impact on the society and the planet uh, through bio change. And so, uh, you know, we, this system change is based also on a, a concept of, you know, changing the, the, the shareholder primacy element, which is really an element of shift in terms of the long-term element that, that Andre uh, mentioned uh, earlier. And so here we are, uh, you know, seeing a, a shift in power in a way happening. Uh, and, and, and that's something that needs to be for sure in one end measure, but also uh, designed to be long lasting in a way that, you know, we have a concrete agenda now referring to the Agenda 2030, the 17 SDG goals, you know, it's eight years to accomplish those 17 SDG goals. Uh, that's a very concrete element where accountability could be, you know, designed, supported, uh, allocation, in, you know, in, in, in asset or strategic decision-making process that can be made in, a, in an accessible and concrete pragmatic agenda and not pushing forward, you know, commitment. So BLAB here in our, in our proposal is really to, to shift this power from, from shareholder uh, uh, to stakeholder. And, and, and what does it mean when you transform your business, your, uh, I would say, your, 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 your governance, by opening in your decision-making process the interest of the various stakeholder, including the planet? You, you create a complete change in the, in the strategy of the company, and, and that's the paradigm shift that we are designing. So now we are seeing more and more uh, uh, you know, uh, companies uh, moving forward. We are seeing also the regulatory framework that help. Uh, it's for us too much based on voluntary uh, process as today, uh, but that with B-Lab, we, we are promoting those new legal form across the globe. You probably uh, heard about the benefit corporation element that by the bylaw, define those uh, triple bottom line uh, 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 accountability element and transparency. Uh, so reporting on where you stand on the journey. Um, and, and that's really it's a core element of you know, supporting the, the system change that I mentioned earlier. So here for me, uh, bring it back to, to, to what we do in, in, in this context of ma massive change. Uh, I'm seeing, and I just want to, to highlight three key elements. Uh, we are using, talking about, uh, during this Building Bridge Week, a lot about you know, impact management, uh, tools, method, criteria, and, and equipping all companies is one of our core mission to equip them with the right tools. So we have designed those B impact assessment tool, the SDG Action Manager. We have more than 100,000 of users now uh, that, that use those tools to, uh, to start, you know, holistically connect the dots, uh, whatever on the governance, the worker, the community, supply chain management, the environment, and the natural capital. And that's uh, actually, it's for me, a, demonstration, a clear demonstration of this increasing number of, of companies joining the movement B Corp or using our tool is a very strong signal that, okay, companies start to equip themselves. And again, the big conversation around those impact measurement tools is, is, is uh, you know, those uh, taxonomy element, uh, and we need to accelerate on that, and, and I'm sure, and I hear this morning with this fantastic project of the Impact Management Platform Coalition that we are partners uh, with B-Lab, uh, that we are starting to clarify the difference between a, a reporting framework and a, and a performance measurement framework, which are two completely uh, different things. Um, and then, um, and then, yeah, that means here um, I found that um, in terms of, of, of signal that we receive from the market, change is happening and, and now it's moving fast. 
uh, you know, we are, we are like a teenager. Huh? We, we started 15 years ago uh, uh, bringing this idea of system change, and now uh, we are seeing more and more company uh, uh, joining and, and, and large one uh, in our movement using our uh, tools and also embracing this stakeholder governance element. Uh, part of the limitation, uh, because yes, uh, we, 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 we have some. Um, I mean, here there is a um, need for, again, back to a concrete agenda. The limitation that I see as an NGO, it's, you know, back to the 10 past years, engaging with board members and CEO, acting them to, you know, supporting them in, in this change uh, process, were it also to, to set the kind of a timeline. And now we have this agenda. So for me, it's more an, uh, a time and agenda management element, the limitation, than really uh, the purpose of company of moving forward, because I guess we, we receive all the signal uh, from, from, from the society that there is a, a, a request for change and there is a request for uh, a new, yeah, a new, a new offer. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. Thank you very much. So, um, so your also definition or your perspective is also that you as an NGO, as BWP, you are there to assist and kind of kick off the, the companies, help them on that journey and also kind of be, be maybe the, the middle between what, you, what society kind of expects, the demands, and then you help businesses to give the tools, as you said, develop the measurement tools and, and your impact assessment uh, tools and so forth. Is that how you would define also your role as an NGO in society? It's or? really supporting the transformation and transformation. improvement. Because what happened when you, you use those you know, uh, impact management tool and impact management solution, you, you learn from where you are, where you stand, and where you go. Mm -hmm. And so uh, supporting them in those transformations through also collective action. You probably heard that we, we've launched this amazing network of more than 2,000 companies now uh, uh, going for net zero 2030, mm -hmm. not 2050, 2100, 2030. Uh, and this is challenging, even for pioneer company like the B Corp uh, to, to, to structure their, uh, their uh, action plan and, and so, but uh, that's, that's the leadership that we need today. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, here for us, it's really uh, uh, more than just, uh, you know, the certification uh, that we give to company with the B Corp seal, it's really around how we gather this as a movement mm -hmm. to connect to collective action and, uh, and uh, our last uh, broad initiative around JEDI, the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion program, get also thousands of companies that have run those internal programs. And it's not just to do good and to show we are the good one in this journey, mm -hmm. but because they want to learn, they want to also learn from others. Mm -hmm. So this, this movement dynamic is really uh, uh, something that I guess it address also the, the needs of, of broader audience, consumer, citizen, uh, because you know, claiming that we are perfect and we have designed our perfect target mm -hmm. and, and we are committed to is not enough yeah. in regarding to the system change that is needed. Yeah. All right. Can, can, can I have a, uh, we, we were told before the, the, the meeting that we should interrupt each other, so I'm going to do that now. Yes. Uh, your question, NGO, um, uh, you know, is an NGO less useful than something else? Already this is asking a question which is fundamentally wrong. It's not profit that gives you justification. It's the p uh, purpose to which you, as you aspire. So you can change the planet for, uh, by, by being an NGO. You don't need to be Tesla or, or, or Amazon to do it. And I think it's important we should remember that. What we're talking about is a juster and better society. Now, that's not uh, necessarily translating into a big bank account, but it certainly is going to make us all happier, and I think we should not forget that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Beth, I'm, I'm turning to you. So we heard, you know, in your elevator's pitch, but also, you know, Jonathan also picking up again, you know, it's a movement and how they started 15 years ago. They are teenagers. So there has been this, this shift away from, from shareholder capitalism um, to, to stakeholder um, capitalism. And um, from your expertise, you know, I'm, I'm quite curious to hear, and hopefully the audience too, the, the role of the board member. Just, you know, um, I want to hear a little bit from your perspective how, what was your experience being on the boards? How have you observed the, the shift in governing a business, maybe, you know, classically from the shareholder perspective, you know, short term profit to long term profit, stakeholder capitalism? How is it involved? Um, how is it involved from your perspective? Have you observed anything from your experience? Okay, well. Historically, I think uh, from a purpose-driven perspective, the old school notion that uh, being purpose-driven requires nonprofit status uh, was never true. That, that's my opinion. Uh, founders usually created their companies or their services with, pro with a purpose in mind. And uh, if you think of the cooperatives, you know, for us, Migro Cup, they had missions. 
Um, if you look at Ford Motor Co uh, Company at the beginning, that's 1914. He doubled the price of the wages of his employees. He kept the prices of his products reasonable so that his employees could buy them. Um, and he uh, also shortened the workday from nine to eight hours. And he was very successful, um, very different from the rest of the industry. If you look at it from a governance per perspective, we had two watershed moments. I would say Enron in, U in the US and Swiss Air in Switzerland. And that really changed the way the boards operated and the, the, what was expected of the board members. First of all, accountability came in big time. Um, and so now boards are constituted, constituted or usually with a matrix of competencies that are needed um, to oversee the business, but adjust the strategy and challenge the management. Um, today, I think uh, Milton Friedman's mantra of the business of business is business, you know, is no longer acceptable. So success is measured uh, increasingly by the positive impact that the business has on the stakeholders. Um, and by stakeholders, I mean shareholders, if you think in terms of dividends, but also trust in the company and its purpose, employees, meaningful work, but also well-being, decent wages, uh, training opportunities. If you think of all of the introductions of in, um, artificial intelligence and replacement of workforce by robots, then retraining should also be part of the... Uh, responsibilities of a company, not just uh, firing people. Also, more and more, the supply chain is coming into um, the, the, the question and uh, ensuring fair treatment, um, but also that they have a sp social responsibility in the communities in which they are, and the planet. I know Jonathan often likes to talk about the empty board seat, which would be nature at the table of a board, um, but, but I think that uh, yeah, it, it's, it's sort of also thinking on like the three, the three uh, scopes of the carbon footprint. You know, it's uh, basically what you generate in your activity, um, what you generate by buying from others, like energy, and uh, what you generate by the clients or the users using your products and services. So coming back to the question about board members, what can we do? I think as a board member, you have a power of influence. You can raise questions. You can um, challenge the management. And you can, get, you can try to get a decision or a commitment from the board. And then it goes down to the management. So basically, you're trying to nudge the company in the right direction. Um, depending on the culture and the type of business you are in, then you're more or less on the scala to the best practices. And so you're nudging them, really, in, in that direction. So one of the important things in my mind is how much is enough in terms of money and fund allocation. And so the question of how money is spent within your organization I think is very important. How much goes to management, you know, if you look at the inequalities? How much goes to employees? How much goes for retraining? Um, how much goes for investment so that you have sustainability? And how much goes for shareholders because you're working with their money? So I think to get that equilibrium right is really what's important for um, a, a board member. And also, um, I think today it's no longer just the president that speaks up. I think shareholder activism is uh, growing and it, they actually um, aggress, if I may say so, uh, really all the board members now and not just uh, the president. Um, being president of Eto Services SA, I know something about that from the inside since we do proxy voting and we represent uh, big chunks of shares from pension funds. So we actually have a voice and we use it. So when we um, write a letter to a company and they don't pay attention for like, say on climate, then um, we write them a second letter and say we have enough shares to request for a point to be added to the shareholder agenda. And all of a sudden doors open up and they talk to us. And if they move in our direction, we take the point off the agenda. Um, we've done that with Nestle and Holcim on sand climate in 21. And they agreed to move in our direction, so we didn't put it on the shareholder meeting. Um, but again, the boards could have re responded better, and we wouldn't have had to block the pension fund shares. 
Um, but when the shareholder activism is coming from shareholders with short-term financial goals, like hedge funds, then I think it's very important that the board members have the courage to resist. They, they should figure out ways to ensure that the long-term uh, sustainability of the company and the environment in which it operates, which extends all the way to the planet, uh, should be ensured. So I would say board members have changed in that they're more accountable, more professional, more engaged, more active, and better prepared. Um, and I think that uh, the training should happen also when you, you look at the selection, or I mean that's not training, but it's, it's selecting. I think the onboarding is very important so that they know the business, and I think they need to do continuous training, both outside courses and training of the board as a group um, on, on these important subjects. Yeah, thank you for just, uh, just to add one thing, I, I think there is this uh, awareness and this growth of interest related to sustainability inside boards. But what I realize also is that it takes time. And when you are on a board, you are not just alone. So sometimes you are just a minority bringing the topic and you need to keep on with this topic for a long time before I would say there is a pressure from outside, there is a pressure from the customers, and at the end things are moving. But there is a question of time, and I know there is a certain urgency, but indeed, I mean, there, there is this process of integration, of understanding, of application, what exactly are the priority in terms of sustainability for each company. And that's why there is, unfortunately, a certain slow process in adoption. But, but I do think it's moved. I think yeah. that in the, in, in right. the last few years, if you compare to five years ago, where totally right. both of us might have been the lone voice on a cantonal bank, uh, right now they've gotten it. They've opened uh, and massively increased the socially uh, responsible investment uh, funds that they can offer to their clients. And uh, I think the ESG side of things is no longer just relegated to two lines in the annual report. I fully agree. It's, oh, sorry, it's a question of patience. But yes, and sometimes we don't realize that you have a quick win, but it's a slow movement behind that happens. But you're right, it's happened. I think in many ways it's reverting to the real values. You were talking about the, the, the big ancestors, uh, uh, the four T model and four. I mean, these guys understood what society meant, understood what um, a business means. You know, the word company, company, eating bread together. You know, you, you unite in order to achieve a bigger output, a bigger outcome. Now, what we are really talking about is a historical blip. Over the past 65 years, the, you mentioned Milton Friedman, you know, the, the Chicago School of Economics, have, which has theorized the theory of the firm, the firm is there to make profit and all the rest doesn't matter. And that we need to correct. And yes, people are getting it. I mean, I can see that uh, on a daily basis, companies are, are more and more moving towards this notion of saying impact is more, it's at least as important as increasing dividend. So I'm, I'm excited to be here today. I hope you are too. <laughs> I agree. But just also to add something, I don't think people on the board are just willing to do bad things. I think that's around the short term is, is pushing on very and other direction and priorities. And sometimes you miss the opportunity to think long term. But it's not about uh, not willing to do good. I, I don't think there is this intention. The intention is good, but unfortunately, the, the circumstances are not always easy. Mm. Just to, to perhaps share, sorry, Jeanette, uh, we, we made a survey in our Swiss triple impact economy in Switzerland. We, we have 300 companies joining a program to define their action plan. We review them and, and connect it to the 17 SDG goals. And part of that, we, we launched this survey about, you know, board, uh, um, competent board and, and, and board awareness about planet boundaries, uh, inclusive uh, uh, drivers for companies. And then, uh, yeah, there is a long road that remains to be done. Uh, and, and, and this is exactly the point of, you know, uh, we, we talk about for, for students at, at the beginning of the, of the session. Here, I guess there is a, uh, a dedication to be, uh, to be addressed at board level uh, because we, we, you know, connecting what I mentioned about uh, system change approach, increasing and enhancing the fiduciary duty of companies. So in the end of board members, uh, if we don't train them, educate them, uh, and, and I know that this term of education and you know, training for board members might you know, 
create some some tension sometimes because they felt that you know they bring expertise for strategic decision making process, but uh, that's where we are today. We need to increase those uh, and create the umbrella and uh, for for engaging them on on this learning journey, uh, because yes, uh, you know everything's changed fast. So even what you probably know and you were sure like a year, five years ago completely changed uh, uh, today. So so yeah, we we need to you know elevate the consciousness and more than that uh, increase. Uh, uh, their training and, and education. Yeah, thank you. I like how, how lively the discussion already gets. A bit to, to your point, Angela, you mentioned something in terms of board members, you know, they are not bad people. And that's, I think, the students sometimes think at least they come to oh, the corporation is bad, the managers are just bad. And um, what I try to explain to them is like, no, they, they are not bad, but it just depends how they are trained. What, you know, you mentioned the, the you know, Milton Friedman came up, you know, what you read in your books. There's an exercise I do with my students normally in the first uh, first session. So if there are any prospective students, don't listen now. Otherwise, the, the joke is kind of uh, taken away. Um, there is a little video clip I show two teams playing basketball. One is white, one has white, one has white shirts on, one has black shirts on. And I give the students a task, count the passes that the white team does. They do that, I stop the video, I ask them how many passes did the white team do, and most of them get the answer right, it's 13. And then I ask them, and did you see anything else? No, and I was like, you didn't see a moonwalking bear going across the court. And they all look at me like, what? And then I show them the, the video again, and then of course they start laughing when this like, man in a costume goes over the court, and they're like, how did I see this? And then I tell them, this is why we have business ethics in the business school. This is why we're talking about these subjects. Because you learn the marketing tools, you learn finance, you learn accounting. But then you kind of don't see the social, ethical elements in it. So it's kind of a really nice exercise to kind of show, always look for something you're not told to or you don't see in the first place. So just as a, as a, as a nice anecdote. Um, all right, so Andrea, I turn to you. Um, so we've now heard a bit, you know, the NGO perspective, the board member. So amongst many of, the, uh, many of your roles, you are also on the board of trustees of the World Economic Forum, whose founder is a strong advocate for stakeholder management and stakeholder capitalism. From your perspective, what makes stakeholder cap capitalism more suited for facing the challenges of today? I think we heard already a little bit. But um, even more so, do you think that there is actually a risk that stakeholder capitalism simply becomes slowly another tool of greenwashing? That is, you know, firms say they're governed for stakeholders, but it's just basically their way to just turn to business as usual. Just curious um, about your thoughts there. There are thousands of ways of answering that question, but I'll try to focus on one. Um, let's talk about the, the COVID, no? COVID-19, the pandemic. Um, we, we, um, here we are, humanity, we, are, we, have, uh, we have had Milton Friedman, we had a couple of other good, good, good economists as well. We dominate the planet, we end the Anthropocene, everything goes the way we want it. And then comes a little bit of uh, something that's not even a life form, you know? It's, it's, it's a virus, it only survives if it has somebody in, on which it can uh, survive. And the whole system collapses. And look at us, two years later, we're still trying to reconstruct something. So I, I'd like to use this, 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 this example to see that uh, uh, what we need to do in business is to go away from something too narrow as a definition. What we need to go as society is that we need to go away from what we were taught at school, in other words, pick the low-hanging fruit, specialize into what you're good at, only do the things which are going to yield the maximum result with the minimum amount of effort, because that's the way we're going to grow the economy. Well, that economy growth is, is, has a very light, I'm trying to translate the French expression, des pieds d'argile. Uh, we, we're, not, we're not robust. We're not robust. And uh, what we need to do in the creation of society, in the way we organize humanity, is to make sure that we can react to exogenous events, that we can uh, deal with crises when they come our way. And so um, stakeholder ma management of, of, uh, of enterprises, to come back to your question, is about recognizing the needs of different parts of society. In, 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 uh, running a company just for money is uh, good for shareholders, but we have many other stakeholders. You know, the, 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 the amount of people who depend on an economic activity to have a, a fulfilled life is much bigger than what we give it credit for. And so uh, if we really want to create a, a stable society, if we want to go towards this 
what I would call the, the, the sustainable prosperity that we all aspire to, will only happen if we are flexible, if we are diverse, and if we are able to manage in different levels. So rather than concentrating only on the, the financial, the produced capital, we need to look at the three other capitals which are equally important. One is the social capital. How do we work together? You know, why do you come and listen to us today? This is a social decision. You want to come and listen to us. Um, the human capital. How do I develop each individual? How do I find talent and allow this talent to grow? Not uh, boxing it in by saying you're just a factor of production of my company, but giving you the opportunity of becoming somebody, of, of living your values at work, of understanding the purpose of our company and coming to contribute to it. And thirdly, uh, of course, I was going to say, <laughs> and thirdly, of course, the natural capital. You know, there is no uh, successful society in a disrupted nature. Nature is the is the the life support system on Earth. If um, if we stop having um, all the services that nature gives us for free, i.e., water, air, uh, so cleaned water, uh, fresh air, um, uh, energy for the sun, if if we stop having all these services, humanity will not survive it. So so how can we construct something? that is um, uh, sustainable uh, with the current management system by understanding the interaction between these three capitals, the social, the human, the natural, and understanding the dependencies of one on the other. That would give us you know, the triangular model, which is much more stable than the one in which we are at the moment, which is you know, taking, flicking on, on a small, on a small uh, part of the equation. No, I'm sorry, I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you made you made a perfect, you know, uh, description of what we call dynamic materiality, uh, and I really love it because you, you, you know, we, we we talk a lot about you know materiality assessment and so, and this is dynamic materiality that is adapt with diverse uh, people with uh, the, the diverse concern and that bring this interdependence element, which is you know basically at the core of our design. So. so no, no, but you, you you said no, and that was the perfect description of dynamic materiality. So thanks, Andre, for that. Yeah. We just think that it's, it's fundamental. What is difficult for people and for all around, it's how do you measure and how can you easily understand this interconnectivity? When you do an action, how can you measure immediately if there is a bad impact on the other aspect? And that is what is complex for humanity today. And I think we need to enter in a playful way of looking at uh, this is very serious, we have numbers, we are all certified, so we can look at these numbers. So it's easy for the mindset to look at numbers. But if we come with, you know, when you buy now a fridge, you know that is A plus or it's C, so you have an easy way of making your decision because you have the financial elements and the environmental element that is quickly, very quick to, to assess. And I think this is the way we need to go a step further, is to make it life easier and more comparable and also for uh, cost customer, investors, just to find out the way and to, to have this capacity to look at the various impact together and make a decision. Because otherwise it's become too um, high level but not e enough concrete for, for people. For but I would like to add something to uh, Andre's thing. It, it's the law of unintended consequences. Because even if you have a good purpose and you have your triangular model, you're still, in certain cases, like the COVID, going to run into problems. And so I think the mindset has to change. I mean, about accountability for a solution-based approach to, uh, to, to changing the world and, and sustaining it uh, globally. When you spoke about board earlier on, you made a very important point. But what is the main responsibility of the board? I see two, asset allocation and risk management. Now, uh, the, 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 you need to allocate assets in order to manage risk properly, and the pandemic risk was a known risk. We've been talking about this for 20 years, and yet we weren't ready. Mm -hmm. Now, today, we're talking about a new risk. We're talking about, well, when I say a new risk, you're talking about a risk that is scientifically demonstrated now. We have climate issues, and we have uh, biodiversity loss. Whichever board today does not allocate resources to manage the risk of nature is failing its duty. And I think that's very important to, 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 to understand that. But risk management is the best contribution we can make to the fate of the planet. But I think the resiliency part
part of risk management, which is beyond risk management for uncertainty, is also going to become more and more important. Yeah, and, and back to stakeholder governance and transparency, you know, the, if, if we really address them, make those, you know, connected back to science elements, we fight the status quo. That's, that's a, an indirect uh, element that, that happened at the board level uh, because, you know, I've been in those, you know, board and, and advisory and seeing, you know, all those conversations, even risk management, but that bring a consensus for status quo. We don't know or we don't move now. We wait. And so uh, I really like this idea of, you know, connecting those incentive for board members uh, back to, to science-based target, but with concrete milestones and achievement. Uh, and then we, we work the, the talk and we work the walk. Uh, because that's the biggest enemy in, in stakeholder governance and, and, and transparency is status quo uh, element. And, and we are enough intelligent, enough uh, uh, resourceful to create those material that block and froze you know, those decision-making process. So that's, that's a challenge. And I uh, uh, just want to add you know, that on. Yeah, and, and maybe linking this back to the second part of my question that I had about, you know, now we talk about stakeholder capitalism. I mean, also the B-Lab, you know, your assessment tools, you know, the B Corp movement is also built around stakeholder um, capitalism, stakeholder management. Um, when I talk to the young generation, to the students, they are very, they're, they're a tough crowd. They're a very critical crowd. I still remember when I talked with them about Patagonia, kind of, you know, here's a poster child of sustainability. A hand goes up. They had child labor 2013 in their supply chain. They are not good either. Um, just a bit to the idea of complexity. And it now makes me just wonder, <clears throat> I'm just afraid what we now say is corporate social responsibility is dead. You know, that's just, you know, just a marketing tool. That's greenwashing. How can we prevent that stakeholder capitalism that now, you know, becomes more and more of a buzzword as well? You know, how can we prevent that that not just becomes another tool for just saying we are managing for stakeholders, right? But then again, the status quo is kind of, sta you know, is kept. So I'm just curious if you had any thoughts or if you can share any, anything from your experience where you see, no, this, is, this will not happen or, you know, or you see it already happening. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, this will go to everybody. I mean, it's just a broad can, question. Can I start on that one? Okay, I think we have, I don't want to say issues, but management is really operational and the boards are strategic. So if you're looking for the group that's going to be taking care of the long-term interests uh, and the sustainability of the, uh, the institution that you're on the board of, then it can't be management. Yes, they need the right values. Yes, they need the right missions. But they have a lot of things to deliver. And so in order to meet their objectives, which are usually short-term, medium-term, they, they, they can't um, think through or, or put into practice a lot of these long-term issues. And so the advantage of having a board is that they don't have a conflict of interest with the day-to-day -day operations mm -hmm. and that they can take the risky decisions that you were mentioning because risk goes with opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so they can nudge the company in the right direction. Um, I think originally boards were sort of meant to be the counterpower on the management uh, and, and represent the shareholder's interest because you're working with other people's capital, really. Um, and since one would hope most shareholders now, or a majority of them, would care more about a sustainable world than their individual profit, um, we would be moving in that direction. If I think about pension funds, which is a group we work a lot to, yes, they do care about the long-term sustainability. They must, but they need the returns. So how much are you willing to give up in order to create the equilibrium necessary to have a positive impact on sustainability? Thank you. Um, what I would suggest is, uh, indeed, if if you expect to fulfill all the aspects of sustainability and be excellent on all, it's too much. And it gives you not the capacity to start. And it's, I personally think it's, it's important to, to focus on one or two priorities where you feel that the company can really reach uh, some specific impact. 
to, to, to give all the power to everybody to understand what is the final goal, how you can measure it in time. And I think it's, it's important to start step by step, to feel comfortable with the first step, and later on to increase to other topic. Otherwise, sometimes this huge dimension of bringing sustainability and fulfill everything and to, to get to excellence, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible step because you don't dare. And just daring, and this is, will be just step by step, do, do some, some elements, and the rest will come and you will train people and you will train also the, the board and the management getting in that direction. Can I just come back to what Beth just said? Uh, this is turning into a dialogue with two persons, which is quite fun. <laughs> uh, it, it strikes me that um, uh, this argument that we've heard so often, uh, you know, can we afford to think long term? We need the returns now, so let's cut corners so that we can uh, make sure that we satisfy the pension funds, that we satisfy the, the, the shareholders. Uh, I mean, I'd like to, to, to counteract to that this notion of risk, and this is very much what we were discussing before about risk management. Um, today, any transaction, and the transactional cost is increasing, of course, any, tra any, any transaction that needed to enter has to introduce this notion of risk more than it, we did in the past. And that means it's a little bit more expensive. There's a premium to be paid. It's like, um, it's like buying an insurance. You know, how, do I, how do I ensure that my transaction of today, which looks good on paper today, is also not going to come back to haunt me in six months or a year's time? And, and that's, to my sense, the only reason why I can justify to uh, uh, value-driven investors that sometimes it is important to make a decision which does not maximize the immediate return. And it's this narrative that we have to develop. So we develop it through measuring impact, you know, the consequences of our, of, of our action in business or in any sort of decision-making process. is not only a financial one, it's also a, a one which has an impact on the free capitals I mentioned before. So we urgently need an impact measurement system which will be acceptable at all levels by investors and, 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 and by, um, by shareholders and, and, and by companies. So in Glasgow, three weeks ago, and Patrick uh, Odier mentioned that yesterday, we, we announced the, 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 the existence of the IISB, the International Standard um, Sustainability Board, which is going to start working very soon. They already published their first governance paper. And we are going slowly towards a, a, a recognized principle in uh, so on stock exchanges of impact measurements. And that, I think, will make the role of, of, of boards and of uh, managers much easier to, you know, to determine what is the thing that is in the best interest of society and not just in the best interest of the shareholders of the company. I don't know if you agree with that, Beth. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. But I think, again, going into that, you have to look at the planet globally. And I think that works in our societies, maybe not in all societies. And it works for companies who can afford to it. But if you look at the small and medium enterprises that occupy somewhere between 60 and 80% of all the working population, depending on the country, um, and many of them don't have the luxury, could I say, or, or, or the extra time and money to actually look at these type of things. And so I think the solutions are gonna need to be uh, declined on a more, more consumer-friendly way than, than what is acceptable for large organizations. Yeah, absolutely, and to bring back a couple of threads, uh, the people who were the, the, the SMEs were much more hit by the pandemic than anybody else. They were, they were dependent on state aid to survive it. And that's because they did not factor it in before. So it's not a question of luxury, it's a question of uh, uh, survival. All right, thank you. Um, so we've talked now already a lot about measurement, the challenges to measure, um, to measure the impact, um, getting the tools, and also we talked about a lot about investors. So um, I, have a, I have a question for Angel, because I also try when I you know, drafted some questions to kind of bring in the, the respective expertise. And background. So, um, Angela, you created Conser, a firm that specializes in sustainable investment and ESG verification. And so, part of your firm's value and mission is to take sustainable finance credible and to make it credible and appealing and create trust and transparency. And that's also linked, you know, to measurement. So, can you tell us a bit more about the role of transparency in sustainable um, investment and how do we ensure that you know the consumers, customers, you know, get the information, understand the measurement, and all of that? 
<laughs> I know it's a big question. Yeah, it's a big question. It's quite complex. Indeed, the, the, the fact is we, we have seen, and yesterday, and I think Building Bridges is really um, a huge success in, in the sense that it's 20 years that finance and sustainable finance has emerged. And it was really very marginal 20 years ago. Um, it was 1% of asset under management. And today, it's just becoming mainstream. So in this meantime, you imagine that uh, most of the banks, most of the asset manager have just have to to develop tools, to develop methodology, to enter in this business of sustainable investment. We had, I would say 10 years ago, 400 funds. Now we have 5,000 funds that are sustainable. So it's a huge and massive information coming into the market. Imagine that on the other side, there is asset owners, so the investors, that have to find their way. They have first to define what means sustainability for my portfolio? What does it mean for my, uh, my trustee? Or what does it mean exactly for, for us? So, and and they, they find out these huge solutions into the market and they find their way. So it's quite complex and it's not, not easy. And there is um, probably um, a temptation to, to find out an easy way, uh, a simplification. This is sustainable, this is not sustainable. And uh, it's not possible because we come to company and we know how much it's already complex for company themselves to define their priorities, to publish data, to publish uh, their impact, to measure the impact. So imagine at the level uh, of sustainable investment. The logic is still to try to give the maximum of um, easy access, transparency on the position of these funds, transparency on the strategy of each manager and each fund, and trying at least to keep it readable, easy to access to the maximum of investor in order to, to sustain and to capture this mainstreaming. Because now there is this logic, the fear of greenwashing on one side, the fear of investing so much on teams inside and not being capable to be discriminate uh, in terms of quality from the other. So I think it's, it's great to see um, uh, the finance industry getting in that direction. I think it, it, it's really important because we need money entering and supporting company making the transition. So it's fundamental that our industry is bringing the money to the company, to the market, to the project, uh, in private market, public private market. So we have to open the mindset, but we also need to support investor finding their way, and it's not so easy today. But I don't want to say it's impossible, and that we will keep complexity, and we'll, we'll need to keep our minds to, to travel in this complexity, but still finding a way that at least is a minimum common de denominator uh, that helps everybody to find and uh, to keep on track. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to add something around, you know, just if, if you look at the, this iceberg from, from a, a company perspective, so on the top of the iceberg, you, you have impact management, but if you go and you look behind, if you don't have a strong stakeholder governance, transparency mechanism, you know, you can't really challenge those impact management approach. And, and that's why it's, it, we should really to address them both in both ends. Uh, and that's what we try to do at BLAB uh, currently by those, you know, fiduciary duty enhancement element and impact management. And so the fact that you mentioned about, you know, those criteria, methodology, uh, hopefully will end soon and ISSB could help on that. We, we just launched last week the, the partnership with uh, uh, 13 different organizations from GRI, OCD, uh, uh, PRI, uh, with the impact management platform. If you don't know it, have a look online. That's the first description of what those mean, those reporting and impact performance measurement framework. Uh, and that's something that is helpful to, you know, have the same reading, knowing and explaining the difference between those reporting element, performance measurement element, which is our key. Because there is a, there is a huge market now also on that because you know, the growing interest and number yeah. of asset managers that are look at to, 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 to assess their portfolio and so. Uh, but as an NGO, we want to put that and deliver that you know, through an open source and open innovation process. Because if we want to make the mainstream, we should not create too much IPs and values on those methodology definition and stuff. This is not the right fight. This is not where we should you know, put our attention. And, and that's, for me, the real yeah. stakeholder governance next step. 
through the stakeholder Open capitalism that. model, the stakeholder economy, the first stopper is that, is those standard element that will be monetized, that will be reduced, complexify for business purpose. So if I can just share that, that's, that's a huge take for me, but uh, that's part of our real uh, our mission at B-Lab, it's to really give them accessible uh, and, and, and yes. I would not say easy, but yes, you're right, it's complex. But it's not that much if we want to cover the 90%. It's always complex to look at the last 10%. No, I fully agree. You know what I mean? And, and you are right. We, we should not just keep it like a black box and uh, some have the black box and others don't have. And I think you are right. For example, the Carbon, carbon Disclosure Project, it's about giving uh, at least a transparent approach about the measurement of CO2. There is, of course, scope one, scope two. Now, after you go on other uh, more complex dimensions, but to keep it at least the, the, the KPIs should be standardized, easy to access, reliable for everybody and for the full industry in order to at least have the same playground around this uh, element of ESG. And from there, you have analysts that make their own mindset that decide that this company, because of this publication, is good enough or is well-placed to face the challenges. This is an analyst and forward-looking approach. But yes, about the reporting, we really need to come down now on specification and, uh, and, and data that are really um, comparable and accessible. Okay, can I ask a question here to my fellow panelists? Um, if we look at uh, financial reporting, okay, I think there's uh, pretty much a, 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 a convergence on the ratings of different companies. But if you look at ESG ratings, you have an incredible variance depending on the different agencies rating the same company. And so although you're asking for standards, the question is, does everybody want standards? Because they might have a different slant on things, and when you choose a standard, so the question is, um, does everybody want a standard? And the second question is, if we do, how long is it going to take before we have one? So, how uh, many uh, years? Uh, um, uh, 22, 23, might already have something workable. I'm, I'm pretty willing to put my head on the block for that. I think that we will do everything we can for that. But, but uh, you know, the title of our, of our talk today, Transparency. Transparency is a word that creates trust, and trust is a word we haven't used yet. Trust is a word that, that becomes very important if you want to assess uh, different companies' performance. Now, the idea, um, you know, you, t you make reference to the financial system, the, f the f um, financial reporting. Financial reporting exists since 350 years. It changes every year. We are, every year we have new r rules, you know, uh, and, and there are still banks buying or selling stocks based on this information uh, with exactly the same amount of information coming into the same databases, coming into the same computers. So some is a buy, some is a sell, and that's the, the I would say, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, uh, competitive advantage of one company to the other. If you're better at catching the buys, you are going to attract more investment monies. Well, why couldn't we have the same situation in terms of uh, environmental impact? You know, uh, we, may, we will have the data, there will be there, there will be a standard, and then the analysts will interpret the standards, and some of them will be buys, and some of them will be sales. And that's wonderful, because that gives us the creativity of humanity. I don't, uh, if you ask me, do I want standards, I say yes. Do, you, do I want automatic decision based on standards? My answer is no. Audit of standards? Like we obviously, audit financial. Obviously, you, I mean, a standard which is not audited will not create the transparency and the trust that we want. No, I fully, uh, fully exact in the same direction. The information published by company have to be standardized and similar. But the interpretation if the com company is a good ESG, is sustainable, not, that depends on your own interpretation or for manager interpretation or analyst interpretation. Look at Tesla. Also, you get all the information and published. At the end, is does it represent the future or for some it's not it's not the the the, the right solution so we we perceive a dispersion of view in terms of how tesla is perceived by investor in terms of esg and that is interesting and we need to keep i agree this diversity biodiversity in terms of perception and evaluation uh, of sustainability of company okay, good. 
Um, maybe to, to chime in here before I open up um, the floor for questions. So this is maybe a reminder to, to those of you in the room, but also online, that in a few minutes I will open the floor for questions. So maybe start, uh, start thinking about um, some of the questions, or if you want to kind of dig a little deeper to, to the discussions you, you've heard. Um, maybe picking up on, on something in terms of those standards, or then you know we have standards, or it's a bit up to the interpretation. I think one thing is also that different groups have different priorities. An example that a good colleague of mine, um, Professor Dorothy Bauman pauli uses, she's the director of the Geneva Center of Business and Human Rights. She has done a study there. It's now this movement towards electric cars because that's you know, where we need to go. However, what some might not realize, you know, where the metals and minerals are come from that are needed for all those you know, beautiful gadgets to make the electric car running, cobalt, and cobalt is sourced in areas that are really prone to um, severe, business, uh, uh, severe human rights violations. So then, you have maybe an environmentally friendly car, but it might come at least in the short term with costs on the human, human rights side. So just again, coming back, I think, to the theme of today, which is complexity, which is about you know, the challenge to do the right thing, to you know, having unintended consequences, or for short term, maybe intended consequences to find then the next solution, just to kind of uh, bring, bring this back to, to some of the, the key words that we heard, um, heard today during the panel. Um, so I hope this like one minute gave you some time to think about some questions. And I know I have helpers in the room, and um, I also encourage you know if we see if we have already a few questions in the room, and I want to make sure that the online audience get also a chance to to chime in. All right. So I have you know can start here with the gentleman in the front. Uh, oh. I was not first. Okay. I don't. <laughs> Go with the gentleman with the green, uh, yellow cut. Hello, everyone. My name is Yazid. I'm a student at the GSAM. Uh, during the discussion, Mr. Hoffman, you mentioned the good and bad companies. My question is how can stakeholders engage with those companies, those bad companies, to rethink everything and uh, to get us f uh, to a new economic uh, model for, for those companies. Thank you. Yes. So I don't remember the, uh, nominating bad companies, but yes, there are quite a lot of them. Uh, um, for, for me at the moment, uh, if you lead a company, um, there are three very important signs coming your way. The first sign is um, the customers. The customers are, are asking more and more about uh, some sort of quality check, some sort of uh, expression of the purpose, some sort of reason for the company to exist. So you don't buy uh, you know, uh, Coca-Cola because it's the cheapest, you buy it because you believe that Coca-Cola carries values that you can identify with. Uh, I don't drink Coca-Cola, but you know, this, this, this is sort of the, the thing, number one. So customers are querying. Uh, employees, very difficult to find talents who do not very early on ask you about what is the company for, what does it stand for, how do we do business. Um, here today we're talking about finance, an awful lot of financial institutions are making it more and more difficult to finance businesses which are not uh, ESG compliant. And when I say compliant, I'm well aware that this is a, the, 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 the standards we were talking about, but there, there is a, a thing in the air. You add to this the youth, which um, uh, anybody in the 20 is willing to break the law in order to get the agenda forward. I think that these are signs which really clearly indicate that some change has to come. Now, maybe not everybody has understood that, and maybe we need a change of generation before we see that, but it is happening. The market is sending the signal very strongly. So we stakeholders, because we all are stakeholders of a business somewhere, we can just be ourselves and, be, and, and leave our values, and companies will have to notice. Uh, um, uh, I have to add to that that, of course, um, uh, markets alone cannot be enough. We also need an impact from the regulator, and so um, you know the, the, the idea that um, uh, a public-private partnership development model is something that's going to help us to build the resilience we were thinking of before. I believe that that still has to play out, but it has to play out. We will not be able to say that, like before, uh, business uh, can continue to develop on their own because I don't think that's going to happen. Thank you. I think there is a follow-up question, Dominic. Yeah. First, thanks for this wonderful conversation. I envy you for your capability to express yourself also eloquently. So let me try to uh, put a question in simple, my simple words. You talked a lot about board competence and also fiduciary duty. 
I believe the three of you, your wonderful board members, and fulfilling this fiduciary duty for the long term, no doubt. I would argue that you also have been in a minority, especially the two of you, for a while um, as, as women. But anyways, how do you think this noble attitude, this humble attitude that you have, is this enough for board members to be so forward-looking, uh, long-term, respectfully acting, or do we need also board accountability? Should we call now the board members who were at the boards of Shell, Chevron and Daimler in the 50s and 60s in hell or heaven and say, you should now be sent to prison? Or, you know, I mean, what is the legal aspect? Would you go on boards if you would be held accountable for violating an E, S or G element? Or should you also change the board setup and bring in much more younger members? And <laughs> I, I think it's a very good point in the sense that you can have people with good intention inside, but you need from outside also the pressure. So it can be from the legal, it can be from the shareholders, and uh, you, you cannot just do it alone. And I think it's always about uh, joining forces on various levels, from the bottom, from the, the, the clients, from also the employees, from the, the shareholder, and all together, it's bring after also the power inside the board to bring in the thematic and say, now you cannot go anymore in that direction, and you, bro you bring with you other board, board member that probably were more neutral, and they get in that direction. So uh, I need, we need, all together uh, this pressure. At a point in time, there is a tipping point that makes the change. I don't know now illegally if there can be some additionality today, but I'm not sure it's getting in that direction on the regulation for board. I be. think regulation follows uh, consensus, and it does. If you look at the environmental situations now, I mean, any company who pollutes, the board members get sued. You know, so there is the intention you know, they should have known better because there was a law or a standard. What you're raising is when there are no laws and standards, are we held accountable for the future? It's tricky because things evolve, you know, and so you're doing the best you can in the environment you're in at the time with the information and, and the projections and scenarios you can do. So I think this idea of intent is going to be very important for the accountability. But yeah, maybe we need to change from uh, calling us board members to trustees or something, mm -hmm. you know, for the future. Um, but, but I think that the idea of using the law to change the agenda, because politicians and parliamentarians are not sort of reacting quickly enough, I like that. I, I also like the idea of going to break a window somewhere in order to get so, uh, a, a judge to decide, you know, because the, uh, we, we need to accelerate all this. Sorry. And just on top of that, the, the license to operate element, huh? okay, accessing to new market or just operating a new market is really at the top of the agenda. And so we are seeing this narrative in, you know, change and, and, and now spreading across you know, broad spectrum of businesses, uh, uh, not only here in Europe, but also uh, abroad. And, and back to your question, I guess, we, I can share a learning. We are seeing with company when they apply for becoming a B Corp. You know, there is this impact management with a score bar, 80 point to raise on our scoring method, blah, blah. And then in the other wing, we ask company to change the bylaw. So to make those enhancements of fiduciary duty for the stakeholders, the planet. And that's, I can tell you, on 600 applications here only in Switzerland, 300 of them jump out because the board wasn't ready, the narrative wasn't set. And so even their accountability, you know, the fiduciary and, and in Switzerland, the board of director fiduciary duty element is really, really poor. And the code of governance is really low, to be honest. Uh, we are working on that to, to change that. But just to tell you that even just at the first step, you know, and then seeing the fiduciary duty element, creating article of association that extend uh, to take the concern of society and planet, you know, it's not, not that easy. And, and I guess that's a good first step. But yeah, at the end, I join completely what has been shared, that we need regulation and we need to change you know, basically the system on, on those, you know, legal form element and regulation. And look at what happened with the initiative, the multinational responsable uh, last year. Oh. Miserable. Yeah. So, yeah, still remain a lot to do, to be done here. 
Yeah, and, and maybe um, to, to chime in here too, because I think at the, at the bottom of your question is even a, a way more fundamental question about individual responsibility, whether it's corporate responsibility, because you know, even beyond the, uh, the board member uh, discussion, there's also the question, can you hold the individual manager responsible for something, but you know, then often they can hide behind the corporate veil. It's under corporate responsibility and not you know, the individual responsibility. I think that's a very interesting question, also something that I bring up in the classroom a lot, because I, I try to teach the, you know, the future managers, the students, to be responsible decision makers, because I also tell them at the end, it's your decision, right? At the end, it's individuals making those decisions and companies, so I think that's a very interesting question. We'll see you know, how, how it will develop. Um, now the gentleman. There is a lady there who All right. Who Okay, there you go. <laughs> please, please don't fight. That's fine. We, we can always switch topics. We're Thank you very enough. much for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, actually, my focus was a bit different. That's why I dropped the question. Um, how can we translate all this in supporting stakeholder governments and transparency in developing countries. Because of course, one thing is to be on a board of a brilliant and competent uh, uh, company in northern countries is much different to be sustainable in DRC Congo or Honduras for what the matter where you don't have enough to get till the end of the day. So, Yeah, I'd love you're... to jump on that one uh, if, you, <laughs> if you allow me because that's part of what we, we are trying to do with this movement, you know, this global business as a force of good movement. It's also to incentivize, you know, developing countries and so companies that operate in those developing country or emerging economy. Uh, and so to incentivize them is to also share this impact pathway uh, you know, those milestones, uh, and, and, and we can really develop those kind of, you know, channel to onboard them on the same journey. So they need to be incentivized. They need also to hear that they are not just, you know, a producer or raw material uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, suppliers, but they also are part of a, you know, a broader uh, uh, um, kind of a, a, a economic movement and so and so. So I guess we are seeing the value chain activation as a huge driver to build a bridge with emerging or, 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 or in development co countries. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to add on emerging market, um, done a, a travel in, um, in Africa just two years ago also about the impact investing. And I'm really impressed how much entrepreneurship is there and how much the young generation is really, really looking for new opportunity, is also getting into uh, fin technology, it's about reforestation. So if we are capable from here to bring to them uh, enough support, enough money, probably they are not so excellent on all the aspects, but honestly, they are really from there that the solution will also come. And we have to trust they are also very clever, smart, uh, I would say dynamic people coming from there and so solution will also come from, from that region. And we will not manage to, to reach the solution if we are unable to combine the energy from these parts and probably the governance from our region. Thank you. First, I introduce myself. I have two qualifications. First, that I am the most unqualified person in this auditorium. In clear, I am a journalist. And the second one is that I have bad hearing, so I'm going to react to what I heard, because the lady on your right is the only one I could hear crystal clear, and then I will react to what I couldn't hear. So what I heard is that in human life in human actions, it is not that easy to know the impact, good or bad, of what we do. But thanks to ratings, measurement, etc., we can. It becomes clear and easy. This has a name. It's robotization of ethics. So why this kind of robotization, which we blame so much in the field of education, recruitment, becomes suddenly the magic uh, stick in terms of investment ethics or ethics at large. This is my question to what I heard. 
So should I? Yeah, let's leave it at that because I also want to give the audience the option to, to have other questions. So is that the most pressing one you have? No, the sec second one, I can ma make it short. I could guess from the little I heard that the Chicago school is not your favorite. As I think profit is the only uh, uh, game. There was a man in Geneva, André Baladi. He was a humanist. And still, he would better than me say why the Chicago school is not as unethical as you imply, and that one can do a lot of good with profits, and that when we talk of the stakeholder capitalism, it means, in general, that there is one illeg illegitimate stakeholder, these are the consumers, they are materially there. You don't give them, uh, you don't lower the price for them when you have the choice of giving sponsoring to an anti-Chicago university or to a deserving uh, uh, NGO. So is that a fair way to define an ethics so, so, if you allow me to start to, 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 to give an answer to this, I never dis said that uh, Milton Friedman was unethical. He did um, uh, conduct a scientific experiment as, as rigorous as the science at the time allowed it to. And the, and, and the maximization of short-term profit, which I was taught at school when I went, it, it used to be the norm. And so people who work in the norm, they are not ethically uh, wrong, all the contrary. You know? It's just that humanity changes. And today we can see the result of a focus on short-term profit maximization. The biggest example for me is the... U Sorry, I can hear that I'm not talking loud enough. The, the biggest example for me is here in the United Nations, the proximity of... Um, of um, uh, the, the, the United Nations gives us an indication on this. You know, the Millennium Development Goal, which were based only on creating value, uh, were incredibly useful for humanity. We, the, about a billion people came out of poverty. Um, uh, the, the statistics in general improved on all fronts. Uh, humanity benefited from those goals. But 20 years later, the sustainability development goals were developed because you could see the price of the short-term profit maximization mantra. It actually destroyed part of the planet, and now we need to regenerate it. So this is not about ethics. It's not about right or wrong. It's about uh, a system that has proven that it is not suitable for running humanity and running the planet. Yeah, and just to come back to your point, because I think you misunderstood some of the elements. I think because of the complexity and the massive data, we need to have digitalization, we need to use probably also artificial intelligence to assess massive information and to come back with the essential. But from this essential, it's about human decision, it's about our in wisdom as a human to decide in which direction to go. But if you don't manage to get first uh, assessing and uh, integrating all this data, you, you cannot take the right decision later on. And, and just to add on that, you know, we, we are standard setters and we are delivering certification process, so we are third-party verif verifier at the end of the day uh, at B-Lab. Uh, and, and what we are seeing is that, you know, assessing through rigorous and automated process operational impact based on practice and quanti uh, quantitative data, you know, we can do a huge part, but when it goes to uh, our qualitative element that need to be in context, that could be, you know, so directed in specific uh, uh, sectors of industry, you need human at the end of the day. You, you need human to, to make those assessments, to put them in the context. So we are far away from automation, uh, from what I call performance measurement. For other topic, you know, uh, the conversation is open. Um, thank you. Um, are there any questions online? Because I, I know I can always see the hands, but I do know we have an online audience as well. Just maybe one question, then we see how much time we have left. Yes, so first of all, I'm going to just say thank you very much as well to the panelists. And what you've been saying has been very interesting. Uh, I have a question from the online audience. Is, um, how can you integrate the expectations uh, of the new generation into the board's decisions? Because there can be quite a large power di distance and difficulty for the voices, I guess, of the younger generation to be heard. 
Oh, may I jump on that because I oh, and, and I will give you the voice, but but we we had this conversation and, and you know I remember five years ago when I shared at the Geneva Economic Forum this idea of inviting those new generation at the board uh, for a conversation. I'm not talking about putting any accountability on their shoulder, but to really to just open their voice. Uh, you know, how I would say most of the room was think that ah this is so super funny, <laughs> and now. When I'm done and I've run with 20 CEO of large company in Switzerland, they have played to invite those, you know, young people to have, uh, you know, three hours in the boardroom to exchange, to share their view, to share their fear, to, you know, just share their readings. And then now this becomes something that, yeah, hearing, you know, the new generation, uh, uh, for sure there is complexity that is not easy to address. But yeah, uh, we really like this idea of the, you know, this invi invisible seat for the nature and the young generation sets. Uh, and, 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 I, and I guess what I've learned also in the, in the past couple of years, is like through the Family Business Network, for example, you know, they have really tackled this uh, next generation approach, uh, onboarding them uh, at the early stage and so and so. And, and I'd love to hear about that also. Okay, I, I just would like to say I'm with Andre on this one. I mean, um, young people need to have a voice. And just one by one, it, it's not gonna do it. And so basically, if I look at my experience with, with politicians in the past few years, they're very attuned to what's in the media. And so the voice of the youth has to be in actions that are picked up by the media because that will influence politicians to push regulation, laws, best practices, codes of conduct in the right direction. And so I would say I would encourage them to plan actions where they would get the visibility necessary to have their voices heard. And, and I think that's what Andre was saying, push the envelope, try it, collectively. Can I just add, this is not just about youth, of course. We need more representativity on boards, urgently. You know, this idea of gender parity, it's still not a reality. And God knows we know about this. So this is something that we should really have addressed, and not only a question of uh, male and female, but also ethnic minorities, uh, people from different age. I mean, you, you, you name it. We are not representative. We are, we are the, the what, what, what do they call it? Uh, pale, male, and stale. And we really need to change that. Is there another question from the online audience, just out of you know fairness? Okay, then one more question. Um, the lady in, in the back there on the left. Uh, hopefully, a quick question and a quick answer. Looking at the time. All right. Thank you. So my question is uh, directed to Andre Hoffman. Um, on the stock exchange, we still base our decisions um, predominantly on the quarterly results, and we see that if uh, a company reports subpar uh, quarterly results, um, the stock price drops. Um, and now, we at the sustainable asset management company where I work, we, we hold on to these companies and these stocks because we believe in, the, in the, their sustainability performance and the long-term business case, but the majority of investors still doesn't. And my question is, um, how do we begin to open up this narrow financials-driven um, way of decision-making in the market to include also people and planet in the valuation of companies? Well, this is an excellent question because it sums up practically what we've been saying for the past two hours. Um, f f we at Roche have a, a, a unique situation. We are in a complex business where the development side takes a long time. So nobody in the industry expects to have a, a winner every time. You know, we, we used to, 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 to failure and we used to use failure to communicate to our, to our shareholders. Not only that, but we do have a stable uh, shareholding. Uh, my family has been uh, a majority owner since the beginning of the company, and that gives us a little bit of, a, of a oxygen when we talk about short-term reaction in terms of price. Uh, it has also allowed us as owner to talk about sustainability at a very early stage. I joined the board of the company 25 years ago. I'm sorry, that's against all rules of governance, so please forget what I just said. But anyway, I have. And um, uh, three years after I joined, we started the sustainability committee on the board uh, 22 years ago. That was the, the f it was on the, the first one in Switzerland, at least to my knowledge. And that uh, allowed us to tell 
while the whole organization, you know, this sustainability issue matters. It matters because we as owners want to continue to be owners in the long term. I'd like the children of my children to have the same influence in the company that I have now. But it also matters because our footprint on humanity is something we want to, 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 to better. So we went, we came with this slogan, doing today what the patients need tomorrow. So we do need that sustainability. And that's uh, uh, allowed us to nudge, as, as Beth was saying before, uh, to, to nudge the, the, the company into a sustainability thinking. And we, it was instrumental in explaining to the people who worked at Roche that nature is not just saving the panda. Nature is not just about nice, pristine nature. Uh, it's about a system where we can have sustainable growth and sustainable development on the planet. And suddenly, the company itself started sending back to the board some small little initiatives which allowed us to improve our sustainability. We're now for the 13 year this year in the top two of the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, so we are recognized as being sustainable. And that is something that, you know, that, that, that would not have happened if we hadn't had this buy-in for, you know, the the typical Swiss model, bottom up rather than top down. And I think that, that, ma that makes a big difference. Now, how do we convince other situations where things are not like this to do the same thing? Uh, this is very much what we discussed and did here. The transaction cost is higher if you are in a sustainable company because you have to look at the future risk. And the purpose, the, the reason why there are so many people interested in this Buildings Bridge Conference this year is because we are scared of the natural, the climate and the biodiversity risk. And we need to do something about that and finance can help. Yeah, so thank, thank you very much. Like all good things, um, this panel is slowly coming to an end. And I know some of you might still have um, pressing questions. So maybe there's an opportunity, you know, during the day to still kind of pose a question to, to one of the panelists off stage. Um, I want to kind of end the panel a bit like we started. So this was a panel. So there was a lot of talking, discussion, you know, exchange of, of, of views. Um, but I would like to end this panel with a call for action, actually, and, and ask each panelist, and, and, and Beth, I think, already started this, actually, ask each, each panelist what type of action either they are taking based on the discussions in this panel or that, you know, what type of action they suggest you take, um, um, given, you know, what we discussed today, moving towards the triple bottom line, moving, you know, um, you know, towards more sustainability. And this way, maybe we can all maybe take away some, some action, action item, or keeping maybe the student in mind, or, you know, some stakeholder. So, um, and, and this time, I'm, I'm kind, I will start with Angela this way around. There you go. <laughs> Just one short action item that either you will maybe take away or you encourage others to take away. Well, uh, I think what we had uh, when we started with the discussion all together to prepare this, um, this panel really came out, and I think it has been a rise also from Jonathan. It's about trying to keep also this biodiversity also at the level of ESG and not having the temptation just to have one only truth being taken on by one. So in this respect, an open data sources where at least the key PIs can be accessible and give afterwards the capacity to all to make their own mind, I think it's really important. And that's, but yes, going to transparency, but also trying to keep the biodiversity inside the financial sustainable finance system. Thank you, André. Well, um, difficult. We, we've done a lot. We've covered a lot of ground today. A lot of very interesting situations. Uh, maybe just one very simple sentence. Um, you, we need to forget an awful lot of what's happened until here. When I say forget, we need to put it aside. Huh? We, sh we should learn from our mistakes. And one thing, one word that we haven't used here today is violence. The whole, to, the, the, the whole prosperity we've, uh, we've access to, we have access to at the moment, is built on violence. We have uh, uh, developed a translational model where we take something, and those who take are the ones who become richer. And that is a model that is not fit for the long term. Simplicity is not going to work. What's going to work now is complexity. We, are, we, we need to find balances in everything we do. The low-hanging fruits are gone. Now, we, if we want to, in a, in a finite planet, where we're going to be 10 million very soon, if we want to continue to create the growth that we need in order to keep the sustainable prosperity, it's going to have to be a, a, a different type of, of game. We're going to have to build uh, the, the future on collaboration. So public-private partnership, uh, international collaboration, um, uh, uh, supply chains which work in unison. This is a huge challenge coming to us, a mega shift, but it's not going to work 
work if we don't try. So if there is a call for action is from now on, don't think simply, think in a complex way. I think from what I've taken off is a, this greater need for transparency and data openness. And all of this comes with additional costs for the people who have to produce the transparency and the accountability. So I think it's important to bring up the positive impact of what we're asking. And so I would also think if we can highlight the positive impacts of going in this direction, it might help uh, accelerate the journey. Thank you. Jonathan. Okay, well, what what you had, you know, <laughs> these are some green people. No, I, I'm just, I, I, I guess, as, as a call to action, I will uh, ask a simple thing, you know, create a space to experiment uh, how to contribute to this agenda 2030. So what will be a call to action, and, and we are preparing uh, an alliance for that that will be disclosed beginning of the year to engage CEOs and board members in building up, increasing their accountability, bringing this transparency, setting up the mechanism for stakeholder governance uh, and lead to, to concrete action plan. So yeah, create the space to experiment, bringing uh, bring the, the right people in, in, the, in this room um, to, to combine system thinker uh, profile uh, with accountant lawyers. Uh, and you will see that looking to this contribution to this agenda to NERD, we are smart enough to, to bring the solution that, that need to be achieved urgently. So create th those space and this, in this stewardship spirit. Okay. All right, so thank you very much at this point. I'd like to thank again the panelists, but also thank you the audience for your questions and for staying with us and um, enjoy the rest of, of the day. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>